I am Paolo Romano. I am a professor at Lisbon University. I'm a researcher also in Lisbon at in SKD. Uh, I'm here on behalf of a European project actually, which is called the EuroTM, which you can see on top of the slide. I'm going to talk about uh, um, the possibility of simplifying concurrent programming by using a new paradigm, which is called transactional memory. Uh, actually, if you were here this morning, uh, Paul Butcher already mentioned uh, transactional memory as an alternative to locking, so you already know more or less what I'm going to talk about. Nonetheless, this is the roadmap of my talk. I'm going to first uh, talk a bit about uh, what are uh, the potentialities, but also the uh, complexities associated with concurrent computing. Then I'm going to introduce transactional memory, say what it is, how it works, like take a glimpse on the internal mechanism of transactional memory and to talk about uh, existing supports in programming language for transactional memory. So you have seen this picture already, uh, although it looked a bit different uh, in uh, Paul's presentation. Basically, uh, on the x-axis we have time, on the y-axis we have in large scale uh, a number of transistors, and you see that in the green line uh, we see that over time uh, the Moore's law, which predicted that each 18 months the number of transistors would double every, every year, uh, would double, sorry, <laughs> it's, it's still true. Uh, nonetheless, if we look at uh, this curve, which shows the, trans the actual clock frequency that we can achieve on processors, we see that we have achieved a plateau uh, at around 2003. Uh, so, basically, the, the era of the free per performance gain uh, is over about uh, since about 10 years. So for 30 years we could hope that the new uh, pro generation of Intel processors would give us free speed ups to our applications. This is no longer true. So uh, how comes that uh, nonetheless we still have an increasing number uh, of processors these days, uh, increasing number of transistors these days in, uh, in our processors? It's because uh, we have multicores, basically. Uh, so, in order to achieve better speedups uh, tomorrow and today, we need to write our applications in a parallel way. So this is more or less uh, telling the same story, right? Over time, we could uh, hope that since the, our processors underneath our user code, our applications, would get faster, we would over time get speedups. So this is, is so-called traditional software scaling law. So when we switch to multicores, uh, we would ideally think that by just partitioning our applications in a uh, number of partition, as, uh, in as many partitions as the number of underlying cores, we would get the same uh, kind of speedups. Well, this is actually not so simple in practice because, well, for various reasons, uh, the first one is that it's not very easy to partition our application in exact, in exact uh, identical uh, symmetric partition so that we actually achieve load balancing. But another key issue is how we ensure correctness. Uh, basically, in order to, to achieve this, we need to start using locks. This is at least uh, the current practice, what we find in uh, current uh, textbooks. And locks come with a lot of issues. Uh, let's start to take a first approach. Let's consider an approach in which we basically protect our applications with uh, so-called coarse grain locking, which basically means a huge, uh, big, fat lock which protects our shared data. Well, this is very simple, because at the end of the day we're going to acquire a single lock, so it's simple to do. But unfortunately it doesn't scale. So let's see what it means. A uh, famous law is the Hamdahl's law. Uh, Hamdahl basically uh, predicted, says, the Hamdahl's law says that the speed up that we can achieve in our concurrent application is going to ultimately be uh, strictly bounded by the fraction of sequential codes that our, our application is uh, as. So assume that we have, uh, we buy a very expensive 128 core machines because we really want to achieve uh, strong speed ups and uh, assume that we have only 25% of our code, which is sequential, which is not much, just one quarter, uh, one fourth of, the, of our application. Well, what the Amdahl's law predicts is that actually the speed up that we're gonna get from our super expensive 128 core machines is just 3.9. Uh, 
And what, uh, what is also interesting to see is that actually uh, the effects of the AMDAS law are more acute, are more severe if we increase uh, the number of cores. In fact, if we have a four core machine, the actual speed up that we will get is 2.3, which is not too bad. It's about 50% of what we can get given the actual other resources. So the more we invest in buying more powerful, uh, more parallel hardware architectures, the more we're actually going to be constrained. And this is inevitable. This is something we cannot avoid. The, uh, the architectural trend is going towards uh, massively uh, parallel architectures. So this is something which we cannot avoid. And basically, course, grain locking is not the solution which is going to solve our issues. So uh, an obvious way to try to get around these issues is to start the grabbing, uh, redesigning our, our application, which in this uh, slide is shown, we have just 25% of shared data structures, shared data, uh, protected by a single lock. So the idea is, well, let's partition our data so that, and associate uh, many locks to actually protect access to the shared data. So uh, since 75% of our application is actually unshared, this can be accessed by multiple clients in parallel. And only 25% uh, is shared. If we have a single lock, we will, have, we will end up uh, with a huge contention on that lock, which is the reason why we actually get only limited speed up. And if we manage to have our program working correctly with many locks, then we can actually uh, avoid this huge synchronization bottleneck in, the, in our software architecture and achieve uh, huge performance benefits. So fine grain locking is actually very good from a performance perspective. On the other end, it's easier uh, said than done to use fine grain locking. Why? Well, it's very hard to get fine grain, uh, fine grain locking work good for a number of reasons. Uh, we have deadlocks, leave locks, priority inversions. Uh, in order to get around these uh, solutions, uh, these problems, there are known solutions. For instance, acquiring lock in order. But the real truth is that uh, software systems are damn complex and they are uh, continuously, they are living thing. They evolve over time and it's very hard to keep track of all the evolutions that uh, various modules of our software have. And sometimes the lock acquisition protocols are not documented at all. And what is worse, as I'm going to show with an example uh, in the next slide, uh, we lose a uh, fundamental property which is desirable in any software uh, methodology, which is composability. On the other hand, testing and verifying uh, software um, which uses fine grain locking is a nightmare. Basically, uh, as also Paul recalled today, uh, there are no uh, structured methodology for testing uh, and provide guarantees on the correctness of uh, lock-based applications. So let's see why uh, if we use lock-based synchronization we'll give away an important property at the basis of uh, software development methodologies which is uh, modularity. Uh, assume that we have a very simple method uh, which takes um, three parameters, two lists and an element which we want to move from one element, uh, from one list to the other. So the code is going to be very simple. We have a list, uh, we check uh, list L1, we check if the element is there, uh, we remove it from there, and uh, if it is there, of course, and then we insert it in the second list. Now, assume that internally, the remove and insert methods acquire a lock, each a lock for a single list. This is very simple. Now, assume that we have two portions of code, uh, which do the following, basically, they're trying to move two different elements, E and E prime. In the first case, the first thread is trying to move it from list one to list two, and the second case is moving from list two to list one. And let's see what happens uh, at the level of locking. Well, internally, uh, on the, we are on the first if, on the remove. You can see that if these two run in parallel, there is no problem. So the first thread will be able to acquire the lock on list one, the second thread will be able to acquire the lock on the second list. Guess what happens next? Both threads try to acquire each other's lock. So in this case, 
we'll have the thread 1 is trying to acquire the lock that thread 2 has just acquired, so you'll have to wait and block. The same happens with uh, the thread 2, which is now trying to roll up the lock, uh, which is already owned uh, by thread 1 on list 1. So this is a deadlock. So you see that by we have no control over it, because this is a simple method, we don't know what parameters are going to be called, uh, and therefore we basically uh, give away modularity by just uh, using by using log based programming. So in this mm, in this landscape, uh, transactional memory uh, is comes with a very simple idea, which is uh, actually borrowed by database words. So the idea is as simple as we wanna uh, run uh, in an atomic fashion a uh, number of manipulations on uh, shared data data items, and we wrap it into an, an atomic uh, compound, an atomic uh, uh, method, and we get that underneath some uh, underlying implementation of the transactional memory is going to guarantee uh, atomicity. So this way we are basically hiding away all the synchronization issues from the programmer. Uh, the programmers only need to say what should be made atomic. They should not worry or specify how atomicity should be achieved, what locks should be acquired in order to get atomicity. So, you see, this way is way simpler uh, to reason about, uh, verify, and composability is, is not compromised. And that's about, of course, uh, when we talk about parallel computing, we also uh, are not only concerned about ease of programming, we are concerned about performance. And the, the promise of transactional memory is to achieve performance very similar to those of fine grained locking. Uh, how? Basically, by using a mixture of speculation and possibly hardware support. I'm going to talk about this uh, very, very shortly in the next slides. So first, a very quick uh, historic overview of transactional memory. This is not a new idea. This is actually a more than 20 uh, years old idea because it dates back to the 90s. This was proposed by two smart guys in the States uh, in a paper of 1993 and it was actually originally conceived as an idea which was to be implemented at the hardware level. Uh, but actually, uh, as, often can, as, as, is, as it is often the case in research, this idea came before time. Basically, nobody gave a damn about this idea for uh, more than 10 years, till when? Till the multicores uh, era uh, started in around 2003. Since then, uh, so over the last 10 years, this has been one of the hottest research topics, uh, not only in academy but also in industry. And if we look at uh, more recent uh, years, we can see that actually the latest generations of IBM and Intel processors now ship with hardware support for transactional memory. Uh, on the software side, we see that there are standardiz standardization efforts going on on C and C++ in order to incorporate transactional memory construct in the programming language. And this is not so only a reality which applies to C and C++. There are uh, lots of programming languages that today is in various flavors incorporate transactional memory. So, but how does this magic work? Uh, well, in practice, there are uh, different types of implementation possible. The first one is purely based in software, uh, which basically, the, the key idea is instrumenting uh, each uh, read and write access to memory with some extra uh, lines of code, which are there just to detect whether conflicts can occur and ensure that if there are two concurrent transactions which try to manipulate uh, concurrently data, uh, one of them is aborted and therefore we achieve atomicity just like in the database world. The key difference here is that the durability property of the ACID spectrum is gone. Basically, the data is in memory, it's not persisted. Okay, so it's fully integrated in the programming language to manipulate variables. The, the pro of this approach, uh, software-based implementation, is flexibility because we can do lots of uh, crazy stuff in software. Uh, at, a easy, at a low cost, right? We don't need to engineer a new chip in order to, to get this abstraction working. Uh, the main drawback is the instrumentation overheads because we are now paying an overhead to track uh, complex. Another uh, way of dealing with, of implementing transactional memory is in the hardware, uh, which as I said is also the original proposal 
of this abstraction back in the 90s. Uh, the high level idea here is basically extending the cache consistency, uh, the cache coherency uh, protocols, which are already integrated in the hardware uh, processors, in order to also track conflicts the, between transactions. I'm going to give more details about this later, but the, the key idea here is that by delegating to the hardware the magic, the cost of bootkeeping and tra tracking conflicts, we pay no instrumentation overheads. Uh, the main drawback is that the hardware is limited. So it's, mm, in some cases it may just fail, and we need to fall back to software anyway. And then there is the, also a possibility of mixing the two approaches, which is called hybrid TM. Here the idea is to try to mix the two words, to try to use hardware, and software approaches for implementing transactional memory, possibly simultaneously, and to try to get the best of the two worlds. So let's look more in detail at uh, what are the alternatives that we get in the software uh, world, software-based implementation of transactional memory. Well, uh, over the last 10 years, as I said, this has been a very hot topic in research. So there have been uh, tens, at least, of uh, algorithms, different uh, algorithmic implementations of transactional memory. I'm not gonna uh, describe them all, but I'm just gonna go quickly over the key design choices that affect, that give rise to all these uh, different algorithms. The first one is at what level are we actually uh, tracking conflicts? Whether we tra track conflicts at the word level, uh, say a memory word in a C or C++ uh, like language, at the object level, or at the inner field of an object, Another difference in the various uh, alternatives available out there is whether the transactional memory maintains a single version of each object or a multi-version, pretty much like in a concurrency control in databases. Uh, another alternative is whether when we write to memory, we write directly into memory, uh, in the memory that we want to uh, wanna change, or whether we instead buffer the write into some uh, private uh, buffer, a private memory, and then we just apply that commit time. Alter other alternatives in the design is whether internally the transactional memory uses locks or not. Uh, in this case we talk about a lock-free uh, transactional memory implementation. And if lock is used, when are the locks grabbed? During the transactional execution or just at commit time? This is lazy versus eager locking. Other alternatives are whether when we read we actually can write to memory to notify others uh, transactions of the fact that there, is, there has been a read going on there. For instance, grabbing the read lock, that's equivalent to writing to memory. And finally, another interesting dif the distinction between all these uh, alternatives is what kind of progress guarantees we get uh, when we run concurrent threads uh, which use transactional memory. Of course, we want to have at least deadlock freedom, right? Or we are as bad as with uh, uh, locks. Uh, but we can give much, uh, there are implementations which provide much um, stronger progress guarantees, such as uh, the absence of leave locks, or even the guarantees that certain transactions, for instance, read only transactions, can never abort. Uh, so, very quickly, I'm going to show one algorithm which is pretty popular in the, in the area, and it's called TL2, just to give you an idea of um, how this algorithm works this kind of algorithms can work. Let's go directly uh, to, to the internal. So, uh, the key idea of this algorithm is to use locks, which uh, internally use locks, which are associated with versions. So basically, if we have our memory of the application, which can be read and written inside transactions, each memory word is, is mapped to an array of versions of write locks. What, are, what is a version lock? It's basically a spin lock, with an attached um, version number and actually we can have two alternatives either we have a separate array of locks which is mapped usually using hash function uh, to map an application memory location to a given uh, version lock or we may have that the lock is embedded in the object so it comes attached with the object and there is no mapping and then how, do, how can we execute transactions? Let's first look at read only transactions. Uh, basically, the, the TL2 algorithm relies on a global clock, which is called the version clock, V clock, up there. And when a transaction begins, it first reads this, uh, this clock. Uh, 
So this clock is going to be used to define a consistent snapshot on the uh, memory reads that are performed by the, by the transaction. And it's copied in a private variable of the transaction, thread level variable. Then whenever we want to read, we first read the lock state, we check if it's unlocked it, then we actually read the memory, then we read the lock back again. If it's still free and uh, the memory is unchanged, and we get that the version that we read in the version clock is less than our read vector clock, then, then our read version clock, then we can go on. Let's see this in action. Basically, uh, a transaction that wanna read uh, that memory location will first read the lock state, will find it free, then we'll actually read the memory, then we'll read again the, uh, the lock. If this, is, if this is not changed, the, the transaction can go on, otherwise it needs to be aborted. And this can be done uh, throughout the transaction execution. Whenever we want to read uh, memory, we need to do this check. This is also why these uh, algorithms pay some overheads. Uh, when it comes to commit time, however, nothing needs to be done. Because basically all the reads that we have done uh, are guaranteed to come from a consistent snapshot of memory, so we do not need to track or validate what we read anymore. The update transactions are slightly more complex, so the uh, we still sample the version clock when we start, we copy it to a shared variable, uh, and then besides doing the, the checks that I've uh, mentioned before, we also need to store what we want to read and write. So what we have read for later validation and what we want to write, because we are not going to write directly to memory, we're going to write during the commit phase. So again, during transaction execution, we do this trick of reading the version clock, reading the memory, reading back the version clock, and we do it uh, whenever we want to read or write. We gather the read set, the items that have been read in the write set, in a, shared, in a private variable of the transaction. When it comes to the commit time, we need to do some validation here. So we first acquire the locks. Imagine here that we uh, wanted to write on that memory location. So we acquire the lock, uh, so the bit passes to one on the, on the spin lock. We acquire the locks on all the items that we want to write. When, if this phase is uh, passes correctly, we increase with an atomic instruction, an increment and set, uh, the version clock. At this point, we can validate point three. We need to validate all the things that we have read so far. So we see that all the items that we have read are still less than the uh, read version that we have in our associated with our transaction, which is 100. And at that point, we can commit. Committing means actually writing the values back to memory. And we do this, of course, with the locks still up. Once we have done this, we can apply, we can update the, um, the versions on the clock, on the various uh, version locks. And that's it. This is an example algorithm. Of course, there are various alternatives, but this is a possible uh, algorithm which illustrates the kind of magic which goes uh, under, which happens under the hood when you use a software transactional memory. So let's uh, talk about STM performance. This slide uh, was taken uh, using a highly parallel machine, which is equipped with 48 cores, each supporting two hardware threads, and it's comparing two. Uh, implementations of transactional memory in software, TL2 and LSA, they are different algorithms, which here happen to be, actually be uh, perform almost the same, and it's comparing with a coarse grain locking strategy. Uh, as you can see, as up to 96 uh, concurrent threads, which is actually the maximum of hardware parallelism that we can get, because we have 96 hardware threads, we have very good scalability, definitely better than the one we get when using locks. Uh, then, of course, we hit the maximum number of uh, threads available. These are CPU-bound applications, which are basically inserting and removing stuff from a, uh, an implementation of a shared list. So we have a decrease in performance. But the scalability up to the maximum uh, uh, level of hardware parallelism is, is impressive. So this is the bright side of uh, STM. We can get very good scalability. But there is, unfortunately, also uh, a dark side the dark side is that if we actually zoom on the first 10 threads and we not look at the graph 
up to 160 cores, we can see that with very limited parallelism, say up to four threads, up to four cores and threads, we pay a penalty with respect to logs. And the penalty uh, is associated with the fact that under the hood we are actually doing all this uh, instrumentation of read and write. We pay a penalty because we need to check whether it's safe to read that specific version or whether we should abort. Uh, this is something uh, intrinsic in the mm, transactional memory implementation if implemented in software. So the actual, the main sources of overheads in uh, software implementation of transactional memory are basically, first of all, the instrumentation of memory accesses. Whenever we want to read or write, we are going to pay a penalty uh, for checking whether we are doing is actually safe or we are not uh, violating correctness. The algorithm that I've shown also imposes, for instance, the validation of the read set uh, at commit time. This is also something which, as a cost, doesn't come for free. And there is also a phase of lock acquisition, as, I, as I've described in many implementations in software. Uh, this also has a cost, although it turns out to be the, the, the least relevant cost among all the possible costs that I'm listing here. So what is the... The, these, are, these are the bad news, but there is also good news. The good news is that we can actually rely on hardware, on the so-called hardware transactional memory, to let it do the dirty work and accelerate the, the overheads that we would otherwise have in software. So let's go back to this slide and let's talk about uh, how this hardware-based mechanism work for transactional memory. While doing this, I'm also going very quickly over hybrid transactional memory, although we have no time to cover this in detail. So, uh, hardware transactional memory is in fact uh, not just a fantasy, it's something which is out there uh, in all the new generation of Intel processors. If you now buy a Haswell equipped laptop, you are paying already for some circuitry which implements transactional memory in hardware. This is called TSX, uh, Transactional Synchronization Extension. And this is not only true for, for Haswells, which are by Intel and are spread from desktops to servers, but also uh, some tablets and laptops, but also for uh, higher end uh, processors, which are normally, uh, which normally equip uh, server class or mainframe uh, machines by IBM. And here you find the set of names of processors by IBM, which include HTM. There is a catch here, actually Intel uh, did it again. It, uh, it really it detected after the release of the Haswell that there is actually a bug in implementation of the, their HTM. Uh, this is going to be fixed in next generation, but still uh, it's something which is not recommended to be used, to be used today, but it's going to be available in next generation of um, Intel processors corrected. So actually it's very ambitious to talk about all sorts of HTMs. There are various implementations. They are not all the same, but there are some important commonalities among the various HTM implementations which you can find out there. First of all, they are all based on the idea of extending what is already there, which is the cache coherency protocol. Okay, when we have multiple processors or multiple cores which access a memory, they all bring data into cache. And this cache needs to be invalidated anyway by the processors when there are writes uh, to elements in the cache. So there is already in, uh, in place a cache, consist cache coherency protocol which is uh, overloaded, extended to also detect conflicts between transactions. The second one is the best effort uh, nature of um, hardware transactional memory. I'm going very fast on this. Basically, I want to give you an overview of how it works in, um, in Haswell. Assume that you have, so here we have our memory, our processors, we have two cores, a memory bus, uh, various uh, hierarchy of caches, and there is a transaction starting with a new assembly instruction, which is X begin on processor one, which reads a variable, say X. Uh, you see that now this processor is running in transactional mode. This is a special mode of execution of the processor. Uh, we bring in L1 cache the value associated with x, which say is zero, and we flag it, the processor flags it internally as read into a transaction. So there is a, a bit in the cache which is used to check, what, to, to say whether it's been read, read, read or written in a transaction. 
if now there is a write to another variable, say y, this is also buffered in the L1 cache, it's not made publicly available to the other nodes. This only happens when the transaction commits with the instruction x end. Now that the bits in the cache are cleaned atomically and we publish this on the memory bus. Now assume that there is another uh, transaction starting on another processor, say uh, processor 2, which is reading Y. Again, this is fetched in the L1 cache of this processor and now assume that even uh, externally to any transaction there is a write on another processor. Uh, this write is basically uh, going to generate uh, a write not only to the L1 cache but also an invalidation message on the memory bus which can be intercepted on this side by the processor uh, CPU2 uh, which can therefore detect that there is a conflict and invalidate the transaction and abort it. So this is uh, at high level of abstraction how it works internally, what kind of mechanisms are, uh, are being used by Intel's implementation of HTM. The second point that I made is, is that any hardware-based implementation of a transactional memory is best effort based. What does it mean? It that basically it provides no progress guarantee, which means that in certain circumstances a transaction may always abort, even if retried hundreds of times, even in absence of any other transaction. Why? Uh, well, for a number of reasons. First of all, the, as all the um, consistency checks are done at L1 cache level, the L1 cache is limited. So if we start reading or writing too many uh, memory locations, uh, more than we can actually store in the L1 cache, the hardware needs to give up and abort the transaction. This is only one example. There are actually other sources uh, of um, aborts, like forbidden instructions at assembly level, uh, the occurrence of, uh, of page faults, uh, signals which can cause a commutation from the user uh, level to the kernel mode uh, and of course there is contention right with other uh, other transactions so HTM alone is actually not enough whenever we use HTM we need to have a full back path which basically means that after we try for a given number of time in hardware we need to give up uh, otherwise we may risk to be trapped in an infinite loop and when we give up, we give up and rely on some software-based internalization mechanism, which is either a single uh, global lock, so we basically fall back to a single lock, which is the current standard approach, uh, which has a big drawback, because it basically restricts parallelism dramatically, so it leads to the extermination of any concurrent hardware transaction. But as an advantage, it works, always, guaranteed. And it supports any not undoable operations, such as writes to I.O. If you write to a file, it's not easy to undo the file write, right? And then there, are, there is the, a smarter idea, which is falling back to a software implementation of transactional memory. This is conceptually very nice, and is what is also called an hybrid transactional memory. Uh, I'll, and why is it nice? Because the fallback path here is not a single lock which restricts parallelism. It does support parallelism, but there is a catch here. It's very tricky to have an STM and an HTM coexist and we are not actually uh, able uh, yet to have them integrate efficiently, at least on top of the current hardware-based implementation of transactional memory. So what happens if we do use HTM? What performance do we get? Well, we can get very good performance the, in certain workloads, so this is the speed up with this, as we override the number of threads, this is an HTM. This is an STM and this is an hybrid transactional memory. You can see that HTM can shine in workloads where, uh, where it is fit. So the transactions are actually accessing a few data items, uh, which is normally the case, for instance, if we want to manipulate atomically concurrent data structures. Uh, this is uh, on the right is power, so the higher the worse. And here you can see that HTM also in power uh, consumption wise is much better than any other uh, alternative. On the other end, HTM is not the silver bullet either, because we get uh, that if the workload, for instance, is generating very large transactions, the HTM is falling back all the time to the global lock. And uh, in this case, the best solution remains software transactional memory implementations. 
As for hybrid TM, bad news. They basically take the worst of both worlds. They don't manage to improve over any of them. So we are really not quite there yet. Okay, so this is how it works. So what kind of support can we get actually in programming languages? What if we want to use it? Well, as I've said, there have been a growing support in programming languages uh, over the last years. Uh, there has been a standardization com uh, committee working on integration in C and C++. Uh, they came up uh, with uh, this keyword, transaction atomic, which makes a compound execute atomically. Uh, inside the compound, we can use any existing sequential code, uh, like function calls, nested transactions, this works fine, but the code must be transaction safe. Uh, basically, it's uh, what what is not safe is the use of other locks, is use of locks, the use of atomic operations, uh, the using of uh, functions which are not known to be safe, uh, volatile, which is basically memory mapped IO. Uh, so it's unsafe what it's not easy to be undone in a very rough way. The good news is the compiler checks this at compile time, so you know it a priori, whether you can run this safely. Uh, you can also annotate uh, with a key, with an annotation uh, external uh, uh, compilation units which cannot be checked directly by the compiler like function pointers. At runtime uh, what happens is that we also have some support uh, which guarantees the atomicity of the transaction. Uh, the lib ITM which is the name of the runtime library for transactional memory in GCC uh, ships with various uh, implementations in software, STMs, so it doesn't require specialized hardware, you can run it on an old computer, uh, and it uses an algorithm which uh, uses the undo logging and writes directly to memory, so it's slightly different from TL2, the one I've shown before. But it also supports HTM, okay, so if you actually own a Haswell or a processor, you can run on top of it, you can actually get advantage of uh, HTM, and in this case, the, the fallback path is going to be uh, global log. What if you don't, don't do C, uh, you only do Java? Uh, the bad news is that HTM is not yet available for Java. Uh, Intel and Oracle are working on it. Uh, but there are still many high quality STM implementations in Java. Uh, this is one I'm particularly fond of because uh, Lisbon University. Uh, so my research group was actually involved in the design and implementation of this. Uh, it's called JVSTM. You can go check it. There is also another. There are more, of course. There are. There is. This is another quite popular one, uh, which is called DuceSTM. And there is also one which is probably among uh, the older one, the oldest one, which uh, comes from a, a Scala-based implementation. STMs are not only available in C and Java, C++, there are actually many software-based implementation in uh, other, in almost all the programming languages I know of. The Wikipedia page is a good starting point for this, uh, if you are interested in checking whether your favorite programming language does support transactional memory. And there are even projects which uh, try to apply the same idea of transactional memory to distributed environments, okay? So you may want to check, check them out. So concluding, get involved guys, because uh, basically transactional memory as a tool can in theory drastically simplify uh, the development of parallel application, can make your life seem easier, but it's a relatively new technology. It's only 10 years of research. Uh, the industrial quality implementation of transactional memory are much, are much younger, uh, much more recent than this, and we are here with a chicken or egg problem. Basically as long as we don't get users to use transactional memory, uh, we cannot get their feedback to improve the existing transactional memory implementations. Uh, so if, in order to do this, to focus research on what really matters to programmers and improves uh, significantly existing implementations, we need your help. Uh, we need to, to start uh, using transactional memory in your, in your software projects. Uh, so the message I want to send to you today is mm, try it out, report about your findings and experience on transactional memory, blog about it, uh, let us know, measure the performance of your codes using locks, 
uh, if you have available already a version which uses lock and using transactional memory, uh, get involved but also by reporting bugs in the implementation of existing transactional memory. You find them, for instance, in C and C++, you have uh, forums precisely for this. So, and that's it. That's all I have to say. Thanks a lot for your attention. Here you find some pointers and, uh, to EuroTM, which is a uh, European research project that sponsored this talk. And if you want to contact us and send us your feedback on transactional memory uh, usage in real software projects, you have their email address. Thank you.